glory. We thank you for uh, the testimony of Jesus being the spirit of prophecy. Lord, that you are making all things new. We just thank you for uh, this man, his testimony of, of finding you, Lord, in prison and then finding that someone he loved had found you at the same time. Lord, I just I pray that that would be something that is stirring in our hearts all day. Lord, just the way that you are orchestrating salvation around us in ways we can't even see it. Lord, would you, I just thank you for what Samantha was praying for, for hope. Lord, would you give us hope that we wouldn't run out of hope, Lord, for the bride coming forward, that we wouldn't run out of hope for the, the great harvest, the multitude without number that will stand before the Lamb, every tear wiped away, that, we be, that we're part of a, a company of people, Lord, that will see you and will live with you forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Anoint me as I speak about these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Cry at Midnight Part 4. And you, you'll get the truncated version today because I know everybody's probably hungry. Uh, we've been talking for the last uh, few weeks, because uh, I've gotten a, a, a little run here, about getting ready to meet Jesus in re related to the parable of the 10 bridesmaids. And so last week we were kind of talking about the elements of readiness, the way that Jesus, he's actually really clear about what it means to be ready. And once we start to see the way that he tells this story from Genesis to Revelation, then we can know with confidence what a lot of the terms mean, that the church actually spends quite a bit of time arguing about what these terms mean or what the reality is. What is grace? What is salvation? Can you lose it? All of these things, they start to actually dissolve when you just get the basic story that Jesus is telling Genesis to Revelation. So what my goal is, is to kind of go through the different elements of the parable of the 10 bridesmaids or what I feel like the Lord has told me to do is go through the different elements of the parable of the 10 bridesmaids and kind of make the connections throughout the Bible so we can see the parable of the 10 bridesmaids is really, it's just another piece of, a, of the same story that the Lord is t telling from Genesis to Revelation. And if we can grab onto it, the story, it unlocks a ton of scripture for us. We can actually understand really simply in a way, once you see it, you can't unsee it, what the, the Bible is talking about. So Lord, I just pray that. Would you open the word to us today? Okay, item one, the kingdom is a family. Because of the fall, a wedding is necessary. So the kingdom of Jesus, or the kingdom of the father, it's a family. It's always intended to be a family. Genesis 128, he made man. He said, let him be made in our image. And then he said, I want him to subdue creation. Like he gave man a job to do that was part of the family business of God, a creative job. Man is different than every other creature. In fact, in Genesis 128, we've talked about this in the past. He says, birds produce birds and the, you know, the snakes produce snakes and the reptiles produce reptiles. But then he made man in his image. Like we're entirely different because we're supposed to be part of his family. We actually, we have a position higher than the angels in our redeemed state. And that's what it says about Jesus, that he became higher than the angels. We were singing that on Saturday morning from Hebrews uh, 1. Okay, now, you can only understand the Bible by knowing the story it's telling. God and man joined together, and God deciding it's not good for man to be alone. So the story doesn't just stop with God and man. That's where a ton of the American church is stopping, me and God. I'll do church on my own. I've had it with all these people. I've had, I can't find a church that teaches the theology I want. I can't find a church that worships the way I want to. I can't find a church that does this. So it'll just be me and God. That's impossible. It's impossible for it to just be you and God because God wants a family. He actually wants the other people that annoy you and that annoy me. He wants me and he wants you. So what he wants is for us to see the full story in Genesis, which is God and man joined together, and then God deciding it's not good for man to be alone. That's what he said when Adam started to name the animals. He's like, he's, he needs a companion. It actually is not okay for man to be alone with God, okay? Now, Genesis is the story of a wedding. Every book after it is the story of a wedding, and thus Revelation is the story of a wedding. And we've, I've laid out for a decade now how Revelation is literally telling the story of a wedding. It gives you all of the players of a wedding. Well, it's not just Revelation. It's literally every book because every book is finding its culmination of fulfillment in the book of Revelation. It's one continuous story. It's one, it's one continuous testimony, really, of God rejoining what was broken in Genesis 3. God is rebringing it all together. That means it needs a wedding because there's been a divorce. 
And it, God is not okay with it. In fact, he paid the price. Divorce was supposed to be final, like impossible to repair. But Jesus died on a cross to, to remarry God and man. And it's very important that we understand the whole thing is talking about a wedding. Every, there's, I tried to do a search today to see how many wedding realities there are in the Bible. And it's like, it's very difficult to count them. Okay. Now, Genesis is the story of a wedding. Every book after it's a story of a wedding and thus Revelation is a story of a wedding. So when we see end time information, we should always be seeing it through the lens of a wedding. And if you look, you'll see that that's just the context that it's always in. It's always in the context of a wedding. So you never want to take, this is the practical application of it. You don't want to take like the characters, the end time characters. Name some of the end time characters that you can think of. The two witnesses. You don't want to take the two witnesses outside of the context of a wedding. Otherwise, you'll miss who the two witnesses are. The two witnesses are actually, in a Jewish wedding, there are two witnesses. They circle the hopa, and they verify that the bride is ready, like that she's qualified in her bridal party. So you don't want to take the reality that two witnesses would be like, I think they are Moses and Elijah, and then separate that from the entire wedding story that's being told in the book of Revelation. You can't do that. Otherwise, you'll miss what the Lord is saying. Name some other characters. Harlot Babylon. If you take the Harlot Babylon and you're like, I think the Harlot Babylon means this, and it's outside of the connection to the wedding, then you're missing the point of the Harlot Babylon. Now, there might be more to it than your initial brush with, you know, this is connected to the wedding this way. It might be deeper. It might be geographic. It might be all these other things, but you can't disregard the fact that the, the whole thing is talking about the story of a wedding, okay? And, and we know that because in Revelation 19, it talks about a bride and a groom. Right? And then it talks about the New Jerusalem being the bride of Christ. Like you, so if you, if you separate the characters from the story, you get this really weird you know, reality where you start living into your own imagined eschatology. You don't want to do that. Name a couple other characters from the Satan. Yeah, you don't want to separate the idea of what devil, the devil wants to do from the context of a wedding. Same with the Antichrist. You don't want to separate the Antichrist from the story that the Bible is telling about a wedding. Otherwise, you'll get the wrong Antichrist. Does that make sense? You don't have to nail all that down right this second. But my point is, as we study the parable of the ten bridesmaids and all of the, it's so, it's like the neuron center of so many wedding connections that as you study it, you'll start to realize, oh, this is really clear. And it's really clear how to get ready to deal with the Antichrist, how to get ready to relate to the two witnesses, how to get ready to not be a part of the end time Babylon, how to get ready for all of these things is found in understanding what he's talking about. Okay, so I'm going to read the parable of the ten bridesmaids, or the ten virgins. Matthew 25, 1 to 13. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, no, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Now, there are many parables that are telling this same story. Jesus told several. And if there's an end time parable, you have to know it's a wedding parable because the book of Revelation is describing a wedding. So you can't separate the two. The parable of the wheat and the tares. It's telling the same story as the parable of the ten bridesmaids with another angle or another perspective or another level of detail, but you can't separate it from the wedding reality. So when you see two things being separated, wheat and tares, one being put in the barn, one being burned with fire, you're actually supposed to connect it, just common sense to, oh, foolish and wise bridesmaids. So the wheat and the tares is really talking about the church. It's talking about all the people watching for the bridegroom. The, the tares don't get ready. They don't become fruitful. They don't abide in the vine. They're in the group. They go to the meetings. They say the same things. They talk about the same things. They read the same materials. They listen to the same messages. They sing the same songs, but they're not fruitful. 
And he says, there's going to be a day in Matthew 7, same exact reality. Matthew 7 is talking about the same thing, where people are going to come to me and say, I prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name. And he's going to say, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who practice lawlessness. So this is how you know that the wheat and the tares, the foolish and the wise, the evil and the wise servants, the 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 false prophets, there it's all talking about the church, not talking about a bunch of bad people in the world and a bunch of good people that accepted Jesus. He tests the righteous is the way that the Bible says it. So when you say, I want to get married to Jesus, the father says, great, let's get you ready. And you know what? I'm so serious about my son. I'm going to test you before you get married to make sure that you're qualified to marry him. That's actually the reality of the two witnesses. A big part of their ministry is to protect the qualified and to send judgment so as many would get qualified as possible. They get to send judgment whenever they want. They're that qualified to be, to be qualifiers. They're like Elijah. They get to call down fire for real. Okay. So Jesus, he uses consistent imagery. Bridesmaids slash wedding party. They're the ones that are called to be witnesses. Now, not all of the wedding party is chosen. Not all of the bridesmaids are chosen. Matthew 22, he gives a parable of the wedding. He says, many are called, few are chosen. So over and over, we're going to see this wedding reality. Just saying the prayer and going to church, that does not make you chosen. That makes you called. You actually have to get qualified into chosen. And the way you get qualified, the way you get ready And that's what we've been talking about the last three weeks. The way you get ready is you give leadership of your mind, will, and emotions to the Holy Spirit so that when you and Jesus are joined together, you're not disagreeing about what to do. You see what I'm saying? God does not want that kind of marriage for his son where the bride is constantly telling Jesus that he should be doing something different. So that's how we, the only way we're going to become one with Jesus is to become one with his spirit. That's what he paid for on the cross. And you do that real practically on your way to work. And when you're waking up in the morning and you're about to relate to your husband or your wife, when you're trying to decide how to spend money, that's when you do it. That's the, those are the moments that you're learning to be married to Jesus. He's, he's given you probably in any given day a, a couple hundred opportunities to see where you aren't led by his spirit and to repent and get led by his spirit. And if you do that, what happens is your life becomes more anointed. It becomes more powerful in God. You become more faithful and you become a witness that it's possible to live in a different leadership structure than is taking the world where it's taking it. That's Babylon. The world trying to get together and agree on how to fix this mess. That is Babylon. When the church does it, that's the harlot Babylon. Do you see what I'm saying? So you've got uh, an adulterous reality in the church trying to agree with a Babylonian reality of let's build a tower and save ourselves. That's the harlot Babylon. Does that make sense? Okay. So lamps. This is consistent imagery through, through, from Genesis to Revelation. Lamps are the eye. What you use to behold. What you, what you choose to value. The, the lamp of the, of the soul, it's your eye. It's like what you want. What do you want? That's a good thing to ask the Lord when you wake up in the morning. What do I want today? Why am I feeling so anxious? What do I actually want to happen today? Why am I feeling peaceful? What do I want today? Why, why is my condition? Did anybody notice this, that your emotional condition is different day to day? It's good to ask God why. <laughs> like, to be in, intentional about your emotions. Why, why am I feeling so great today? What do I want? Is that going to be disappointing? Is that what Jesus wants? Sometimes you can be really excited about something really, really negative. Do you know that? You can be really emotionally like, this is a great day because something really negative is is in your desire and you think it's going to happen. Like winning, like getting way, getting one over on somebody. Like, you know, some people, they'll literally go to the store and they think, I got such a great deal. And they'll testify that that was the Lord that they took advantage of. I've heard it many times that they literally took advantage of somebody else. Believers, have you ever heard that before? That's, that's, a, that's a wrong use of your emotions. Like, we want to actually be mindful. Why am I feeling what I'm feeling? Like, is it what Jesus is feeling? Okay, because he says, sometimes I play the wedding dance, and nobody wants to dance. And I play the funeral dirge, and they won't dance to that either. Like, there's both. It's not just, if you're happy, that's God. But there's a lot of people in the church right now that think that that's the case. If I'm winning, if I'm successful, if I got the money, if I'm doing better, that's blessing. That's not true. According to the Bible, that's not true. What's blessing is agreeing with the leadership of God so you're ready to marry Jesus and live with him forever. That's blessing, okay? The groom, that's Jesus, 
consistently. The imagery of the groom in the Bible is Jesus. There's many types and shadows of Jesus that are related to this. Delay. Everybody say delay. Delay is a reality from Genesis to Revelation that's part of this wedding reality. How many of you guys have felt delay? You're like, I know something's supposed to happen. It doesn't seem to be happening in the time that I think it should happen. Well, that puts you in the story the Bible is telling. That's, that's actually every single person, Abraham, like a very long delay to have Isaac, very long. Every, there's just so many of these realities. So when you see in the parable of the tender bridesmaids, there was a delay. You're actually supposed to understand what that means. Like, it didn't happen when they wanted it to. And you think, you see this happening at all right now? People are like, I think Jesus is coming. And then suddenly they're like, it's not happening. I thought it was. That's the story. It's easy. This is really simple. You know, this doesn't take a ton of decoding. But we miss it when we start to symbolize a lot of these realities. We'll actually miss what the Bible's saying in the name of the Bible. Okay, sleeping, losing focus, death, like spiritual death, going backwards. Like that's what sleeping means. That's what this is describing in here. It's falling back. Like the, all of the bridesmaids, when the bridegroom was delayed, they felt this pull to go back to normal, to just fall asleep, to nothing is happening. Anybody feeling that right now? You should be (laughs) because we're in this story. Like you should actually be feeling a pull, a pull to be like, just going back to normal. That's not what you want to do. But it is in the story. So it's good to understand this is the story. If you, if you really like grit your teeth, like, I'm on fire. I've always been on fire. But you're not really on fire. Then you're lying. And you're actually way more at risk of being cast out of this wedding if you're lying about it. That's what the, the, the foolish bridesmaids, like, they just never have a good reason to change. You, wanna, you have great reasons to change. Falling asleep is one of them. That's a great thing to pray about, okay? But if you just pretend like I'm just always on and like, you know, I'm really excited for Jesus, but then you go live like the world. You're not really excited for Jesus if you're living like the world, okay? Uh, trimming, this idea of trimming. That's, that's cutting off the wick. We've talked about that a couple of times. You trim a lamp. I didn't know this until recently, but trimming a lamp isn't adjusting the height of the, the, the wick. It's actually trimming it because a dirty wick will produce a dirty smoke that actually is not a clear burn. And so when you trim a lamp, you cut off the excess stuff that's like not clean. And that's really what he's talking about right here. And that's sanctification, seeing God rightly, witnessing, wedding, the event of being joined to Jesus forever. This is a consistent theme throughout from Genesis to Revelation. The door, it's the gate of our kingdom or our heart and the gate of his. When you see a door, song of songs, tons of door realities and gates and gardens. And the song of songs is a wedding reality. There's lots of doors. If you start to look for doors in the Bible, opportunities, places where you, the, somebody could have invited God, places where somebody kept a door open when God had closed it, ba- Balaam comes to mind. Balaam gets an answer. He just keeps opening that door. Is there another answer? Is there another answer? Is there another answer? And then God lets him walk through that door. We want to understand these realities. Do you see what I'm saying? These are things that mean something. Knowing equals becoming one. Okay? I never knew you. You never became one with my heart. Knowing is a, is a biblical term for uh, uh, intense relationship. Okay? Um, I think you know what I mean. Get it? Knowing, know what I mean? Sifting, closing, sending away. Okay, so sifting, closing, or sending away, that all equals shaking, removing, separating, for burning, gnashing of teeth, or separating for shining, enjoying, or for leading. Anytime you see these realities, sifting, closing, or sending away, you're seeing a separation between those who want God's leadership and those who don't. Those who don't want God's leadership, they're going to a lake of fire. There is burning. Those who do want God's leadership, they're going into a barn. They're going into a harvest. They're going into a fruitful reality. They're going into a marriage. They're going into, you know, oneness with God. Like, th- these are really simple terms. But it's said in a variety of ways because we all have a heart that's unique, and we're all living with a different set of circumstances. Just appreciate Barbara's testimony. Barbara has a set of circumstances that actually define these terms for her. These mean certain things because of the way that she's lived her life. Annie has a different set of circumstances that she views these things through. So when we see Jesus like telling the same story a bunch of different ways, we can know he knows how to reach our heart. These words are alive. There are different moments where different parables will mean something to you when they didn't mean something to you the day before. And there's certain times when you're reading something and it's just moving your heart so much, you go back to it a few months later and you're like, 
I don't see it. Like, I can't remember what it was that just impacted me so deeply. That's because you're changing, you're growing. And so we don't want to just be like, everything has to mean X because I think it means X. What we want to do is we want to get a heart for the wedding story and let the Lord talk to us through these realities. But if we just in the flesh argue with each other about what every parable means, what all every eschatology is, what all these things are, we won't get any closer to God and we won't get any more understanding. This spirit, this is a spirit-inspired reality. You, you actually need a veil taken off of your face. A veil is a wedding reality. We actually need the veil pulled back, and we need to see Jesus more clearly and let him see us more clearly. That's part of the process of getting ready, okay? And, and there's a passage uh, that we're going to read here in just a second, because uh, it's the next thing in the notes, and I didn't realize that we were right there. Okay, so uh, understanding these elements will unlock huge portions of scripture, under, and understanding to us, if we'll learn to see these elements by the Spirit. Okay, so 2 Corinthians 3.15. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, everybody say nevertheless. That veil's no problem is what that means. That veil's no problem. If you want to turn to the Lord, if you want to see, you want to get into your wedding, you want to, you want to inside look at what it's going to be like, turn to the Lord. Tell him, there's a veil here. I don't get it. I don't feel it. I want to. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty or freedom. But we all with unveiled face, say unveiled, beholding as in the mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord. So if you want to get ready for your wedding, learn how to see Jesus. That's the point. That's who you're marrying. You go where you're looking, okay? And that's what we want to do. We want to study Jesus' heart, his emotions. We actually want to see, okay, Jesus, what do you think about the Harlot Babylon? I can listen to 20 different opinions on the, on the internet about what people think about the Harlot Babylon. How many times have you asked the Lord, Lord, what do you think about the Harlot Babylon? You've got no right to argue with anyone if you haven't gotten revelation from the Lord about it. You see what I'm saying? It's Jesus' story. Like, he wrote it. He's the one telling it. He's given us his Holy Spirit. We actually have to be willing to ask him what these things mean and to talk to him like the Antichrist, the timing of his return, all of these things. Like we should actually be asking him. This is the most important thing in humanity's history. And we're mostly like, we just kind of want to argue with each other about it. Do you see this happening online? It's going to happen way more. As more signs happen and more people are convinced this is the return of Jesus, you're going to be tempted into more and more arguments about what these things mean. You don't want to do that. That's not ready. That's eating and drinking with the drunkards. That's the evil servants. Like, I got time to figure this out. I'll kind of hash it out with all my buddies. You want to talk to the Lord. Lord, what do these things mean? Okay. These elements all relate to some basic terms for God's pe for the people God is calling out of the world. I don't, I'm not going to belabor this point because we just talked about it. Item F, God takes everyone called and then sifts out the chosen. So the chosen, all the people that God is saying, okay, I'm going to move forward with you. This is the way that they're described in different parts of the Bible. And there's more than this. It's just the ones that I felt like I should highlight today. The wedding party, the bride, Israel. Israel of God is the way that it says it in uh, Galatians, and I'm going to read that passage to you in a second. Now, this is important because people misuse the term Israel of God. Israel of God is actually code word for replacement theology, but it's also a phrase in the Bible. So we want to know, what does that mean, the Israel of God? What does that mean? Now, the, the, those born again of the spirit of prophecy. Now, the rejected or those being sifted away or sent out, that's the harlotress or Babylon or those born of the flesh or Hagar. Hagar is a good story to see, like somebody sent away. Why was Hagar sent away? Well, Galatians tells us, because that was the, the son that was born of the flesh, but there was a son that was going to be born of the promise. There was one to wait for in faith and to be sanctified in, in agreeing with God's heart for the fulfillment of the promise. That's the reality between the bride and Babylon. The bride believes all the same things that Babylon believes need to happen. She just believes in a different solution. She believes in waiting for the promise of the Father. She believes in the, the child born of the Spirit, not the one born of the flesh. Babylon believes the same things as the bride, just wants them to happen now under her control. And so she tries to get agreement. Do you see this happening in the church right now? It's happening all over the place. If we could just agree about these things and our united effort will then break through the schemes of the enemy. That's not the story the Bible is talking about. The story the Bible is talking about is to make peace with your adversary. 
like to actually resist the devil and let him flee from you, not cooperate with him by taking on his same characteristics. You don't resist the devil by acting like the devil. You resist the devil by acting like Jesus. Jesus isn't afraid of the devil. Jesus isn't like, get away from me, Satan. You're hurting me. He says, get away from me, Satan. I'm not listening to you. Like, I'm not agreeing with the spirits that you're trying to stir up in my emotions. Do you see what I'm saying? That's how you resist the devil. Okay. Now, Galatians 6, 15 to 16. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. And as many as walk according to this rule, or say as many, as many as walk according to this rule, as many people say, I got to change. I got to change and I need the Holy Spirit to change. As many as say that, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. That's what the Israel of God is. It's people saying, I've got to change and let the Holy Spirit lead me. And he hasn't given up on Israel. And he hasn't given up on Gentiles. He hasn't given up on Muslims. He hasn't given up on anybody. He's looking for people that are saying, I want you to lead me. And then he'll join you. He'll graft you into Israel. But he won't get rid of Israel to do that. He, isn't, he doesn't not care about Israel to do that. He cares about everybody. He just makes you a part of the children of the promise. In Israel, the people... And there's a lot of, if you start to, I, I find this out in real time. I didn't learn this in a book. You start to talk, talk about Israel. People will start to define Israel all around you. Well, Israel doesn't mean this. Israel doesn't mean this. Israel doesn't mean this. Israel means anybody that wants to be connected to the leadership of Jehovah and genetically being Jewish is the root of all of that. And so we, you can't disregard political Israel. You can't disregard Jewish people living in America, you can't disregard people grafted in that are Christians that want the Holy Spirit. Like, it's all the Israel of God. Do you see what I'm saying? So he doesn't have to get rid of one for the other, and he doesn't. Romans 11, 1 to 5. I say then, has God cast away his people? Now, why am I saying this in the context of this message? Why do I suddenly start talking about Israel? Well, because the wedding party, the bride, she is Israel. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. Yes, she is Israel. She's, she's actually not just Israel. She's Jerusalem. She's not just Jerusalem. She's the new Jerusalem. And she's everyone that moans and sighs over the abominations that gets grafted into this root remnant of people that aren't willing to violate God's leadership in order to get the promise. There is a remnant in Israel right now that is unwilling to violate God's leadership to get the promise. They don't know the Messiah yet. They don't know that Jesus is the Messiah, but they have an unwillingness to violate the principles that this book talks about from cover to cover. But in the church, you've got a ton of people willing to compromise all that to get people to like them, basically, and to win. And they're not part of Israel. They will never be. And some of them even use the term Israel of God like they're the chosen ones. They're the second coming themselves, but they're nothing to do with Israel. Israel are the people that wait in faith for the father to fulfill his promises. And there's a remnant of genetically Jewish people that are doing that right now. And some of them live in political Israel right now. And they are Zionists. And it's not wrong that they're Zionists. It's just Zionism isn't going to get them the city of Jerusalem. What's going to get people the city of Jerusalem is crying out to the Lord prophetically, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Okay. I just covered a ton of different topics that people have been arguing with me about for a week now. Okay. So Romans 11, 1 to 5. I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. And then I skipped a bunch of verses for the sake of space and time. Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. So if you want to know what the remnant means in Revelation 7, it means the same thing as the remnant in every other part of the Bible. It means there are people that are mostly unseen. Elijah didn't see the remnant in his day. He did not realize there were 7,000 people the Lord had kept for himself that were a remnant of faithful people in Israel. Elijah thought he was the only one. We find out in Revelation, there is a remnant. How big is the remnant? Well, I mean, if you take it literally 144,000, 12,000 from the 12 tribes, there's a remnant of faithful people in Israel. I don't know if that's the right way to take it. I asked Jesus about that quite a bit. I feel like it's probably, that's a symbolic number of a, of a perfect remnant. But I don't know exactly. But there is definitely a remnant of faithful people that are waiting for the Messiah to do the things that a bunch of other impatient people are trying to get to happen, specifically on the Temple Mount. There's a bunch of impatient people that want some stuff to happen on that Temple Mount, and they're Jewish. And they're not faithfully the remnant, though they could be. They could repent and become faithfully the remnant. And I'm speaking specifically of the Temple movements that are like 
any way they any way we can let's get up there let's split it with the muslims let's you know we just got to get some worship going here that isaiah 66 talks about that and so when we see that we don't want to be like oh they're part of our bridal party no they're not but they could be if we're a witness of waiting for the Lord to do the things that need doing in our own lives, in our own marriages, with our own kids, with our own jobs. Do you see what I'm saying? It's a powerful witness. If you run into somebody that's waiting on the Lord in adversity, you will never forget them. You probably have run into several people and you can remember them. I can remember the people that I've seen peaceful and patient in adversity and hopeful. It's one thing to be apathetic in adversity. It's an entirely different thing to be hopeful in adversity. Okay. And that's the witness, though. that's the wedding party he's looking for. Okay. Now, Isaiah 62, verse 4. You shall no longer be termed forsaken, speaking of Jerusalem or Zion, nor sh shall your land any more be termed desolate, but you shall be called Hephzibah in your land Beulah, for the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. As a young man marries a virgin, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem, and they shall never hold their peace day or night. You who make mention of the Lord, do not keep silent. Do you guys make mention of the Lord? Yeah, you mention him in conversations. You, t you know, I think God's doing this. I, you know, this is my God. I, you know, I think God's going to work this out. If you make mention of him, don't keep silent. Don't keep silent. Like if you're his, if you're getting married to him, this is what is on his mind. This is what is on his heart. And so we can't possibly get ready for a wedding separate from the very thing that is on our groom's mind. This is on our groom's mind right now. That's why every house of prayer, by the time it's all said and done, it will be Jerusalem-centric. It will be praying day and night in agreement with Isaiah 62.4, and you can't do that in truth without praying for all the other stuff that's going on in your own rebellion, your own closed walls, unwillingness to receive that king and say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Every place that we do not receive him that way, we have no authority to pray for Israel that way. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay. Now, those who overcome equal saints, wise servant, we, the maturing bride, the faithful, those who pray night and day. These terms, they're used in a bunch of different parables and a bunch of different places through the Old Testament and the New Testament. But you can know when you see saints, wise servants, wheat, the maturing bride, the faithful, that's those who pray day and night because of what I just told you about Isaiah 62.4. If you are part of the great cloud of witnesses, you're praying day and night that that Israel would say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Which Israel? All of it. The Israel of God, all of it. That, that Luke, when he wakes up and he's got to go do something he doesn't want to do, he'd say, blessed is he who comes in the name of Jesus, come. Like, help me have the right attitude about this. When I wake up and I don't want to deal with what I got to deal with, I'm like, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus, give me your heart attitude about this. Though I don't want to just go grip my teeth and get it done and be a terrible witness of somebody who knows Jesus. I want to go and do it in the, in the true reality of the way Jesus feels about it. I want to take care of my, my sons in the true reality of Jesus's heart for them. I want to love my wife in the true reality of Jesus's heart for her. I want to be a good witness. I want people to see me the way that I deal with like being slighted at a restaurant or whatever it is in the true reality of what it means to be a, a person that has hope in Jesus. I'm being ready to give an account of that hope. Does that make sense? This is how we get ready for our wedding. And this is what is being described as the wedding party. Now, five of the wedding party do what I'm describing to you. Five love the idea. They love the teaching. They love the meetings. They just, when the rubber meets the road and they're in a stressful situation, they refuse to acknowledge that they're not growing. They just think, God makes accommodations for all of the ways that I don't want his leadership. He does not. God does not make accommodation for us not wanting his leadership. He's patient, though. He's very patient, and he keeps no record of wrongs. So if we come to ourselves and we realize I'm not all that in a bag of chips, and I do actually have some things that i got to change, and there's a bunch of stuff that I don't understand and I don't know, and we say, God, make me ready for my own wedding, he will. He will. And that happens like in the, in the micro decisions, like two or 300 maybe in a day that you are making. And if you made, let's just say you made five of those decisions better than you did the day before. Would that be you or would that be a miracle? That'd be a miracle. Your very breath is a miracle. Like your thoughts moving through your brain at the right speed so that you can comprehend them. That's a miracle. So any improvement is a miracle. It's growth. It's, being, it's abiding in the vine, any real improvement. Now, this is the problem. 
You can trick yourself out. You can fake yourself out. You can grit your teeth and pretend to be patient. But inside here, nothing is changing. Just get more resentful, keep a better record of how you're going to, you know, eventually you're going to have enough. I don't know when I'm going to snap, but when I snap, you know, I'm going to snap at some point in time. People don't start getting it together. I'm gonna, that, you're not that gritting your teeth and appearing to be patient is not working. You actually have to get a few of these decisions. The way that you make them has to change. Like the, the way that you see your situation or, or the way that, you know, you, you talk about the other people that you are around you that you see failing. Like all of these things. Jesus, he never pretends an emotion. He never gives somebody one impression when he's talking to them. Then he looks at the father. He's like, yeah. he would never do that. We do that. We all do that. Okay. And this is the season when we have to stop doing that. We actually have to say, God, I'm not okay doing that. That's, that heaven is never going to work that way. It's not going to operate that way. Okay, now, those who stumble, those who fall away, tares, evil servants, synagogue of Satan, the hardening harlot Babylon, these are those that won't change into the bride, the impatient, the fearful, the cowardly. It's those who compromise truth for perceived safety. That the, the, all of those terms mean the same thing. Those who compromise truth for perceived safety, that's Babylon. That's the tares. That is the synagogue of Satan that say they're real Jews, but they're lie. They're not. They look like Jews. They look like they're the Israel of God. They look like they're grafted in. They look like they were part of the root. They look like the remnant, but they're not. They lie. They lie. They are willing to compromise truth because they're afraid. Now, this is the way that that looks, that looks practically. Those who compromise truth for perceived safety. Wealth. They're willing to compromise truth to make a little bit more money because True greed is really related to fear of running out. And you find that out if you get a bunch of money and you find out, oh, that feeling of running out, it never goes away. You could have a million dollars, it just takes a couple of months, and you'd start to think, I'm still afraid of running out. There's people that have 10 million, they're like, I don't have enough to retire. It's just because they're used to having 10 million. There's people that got 50,000, and they win it in the lottery, and the next thing you know, their entire lives are shambles and a wreck. We'd be like, it's 50 grand. Like, why, why are you guys fighting over 50 grand? It's, just, it's all relative scale. This idea of being afraid of running out, it is nasty. This, this, is, this will make you a tear. The love of money is the root of many kinds of evil. Reputation. Those who compromise truth for the sake of their reputation. This is coming to light all over the church right now. People that have hidden racism, hidden misogynistic attitudes in the church because they didn't want to lose the following of the base. It's all over the place. Compromising truth for reputation. For, it's for God, though. We don't want to embarrass the church. Some people want to come to the church. They won't. But no, Jesus would never lie to build a following. Never. He would never cover up the truth to build a following. He would never water down the truth to build a following. In fact, that's why he lost a following over and over, and then he built it back up because he kept telling the truth, and then he'd lose it because he kept telling the truth, and then he built it back up because he kept telling the truth. This is the way something is sifted. Do you see what I'm saying? We want to be sifted into the kingdom. We don't want to be compromisers for the sake of the kingdom because it's not real. It's a lie. Okay? Um, position acceptance. There's many people who will compromise the truth just to get accepted. You don't want to fall into that in comfort. So the end time Babylon or the singer of Satan or those who fall away or the tares, they refuse to separate from the worldly church that enters into the end time events described in Revelation 2 and 3. So you can know all that's talking about the church because Jesus addresses seven churches directly in Revelation 2 and 3 and says, look, this is the problem that you're having in your fear they're all related to fears. And if you won't repent, then I'm going to take away your lampstand. I'm going to blot out your name. I'm going to, you know, all these different ways. He's like, I'm going to sift you out of my church. That's talking about the 10 bridesmaids, the five foolish, right? They're all going to church. They're all seven churches. He's like this. So if you want to know, like, how do I avoid this moment in time when the midnight cry happens? I find out I don't have any oil and I'm supposed to be ready. How do I actually avoid that? Well, then you connect these terms and you start to realize, oh, this is really clear. It's actually really easy, but it's very difficult right here. And then if you do that, what you will do is you will spend your time praying about you being one with his emotions, his mind, and his will. Okay, and that's what we're doing. So we should be really excited that we're all standing in a place and Samantha just told us that's what this whole church is about. And so he, for whatever reason, has decided to gather us into this barn. We just don't want to quit. 
We don't want to quit until we're clean because we are, as long as we're saying yes to truth and love, to the sifting process, we are part of that Israel of God. We are part of that bride. We can get more connection to what the groom cares about. That's the point of being here together, okay? And we're going to talk more about the wedding party next time. We, we just keep getting so close. I've had this in the notes, I think, from the beginning, and we never get here Steph and Lando, you guys want to come back up? We just never quite make it to this part. And I'm tempted to read it while we're waiting, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to pray. So let's stand together. Just while we're eating today, while we're spending a little bit of time together. I just think the Lord, he wants to give us eyes like fire. He wants to give us eyes to see each other the way he's qualifying us the way that he's actually sifting us in, in a way that would give us encouragement to keep letting him have access to the way we see each other. So Holy Spirit, I mean, if you want that, let's just tell him, I want eyes like fire. I actually want to see people the way you see them, Jesus. Just as you bring new people, I want to see what they need, what they really need. I just hear the Lord saying, people would tell you they need one thing. He says, I see something else sometimes. I actually need something else. Lord, would you give us eyes like fire that when we hear each other, we discern what we really need, what we're really hurting about, what we're really longing for, and that we'd be willing, Lord, to, to pray into it, to speak into it, to prophesy into it. Lord, that we'd hear each other. And I just pray, Lord, that you'd help us not to look at each other as problems to be solved. God, but places to receive blessing from the Lord. Would you help us to hear each other, Lord, is? Places, Lord, that need a little bit more fertilizer and water to grow. God, not, not places that just need to be cut off and thrown out because we're tired or because we're afraid of what will be asked of us. God, in this room right now, would you just send eyes like fire? You're a master gardener. Just give us eyes like you, God. We'd see just exactly, Lord, how to tend your garden. Would you pour out wisdom and revelation this morning? Just even as we, as we have a conversation while we're eating together, Lord, that we just be mindful of the way that our tongue, that it can start fires, that it can steer ships. Or would you help us to be mindful of your garden, of your your wedding party, Lord, your bridesmaids. Just help us be mindful. In Jesus' name, amen.